um, topic. And um, just remember um, that at the end of the session, I will, I will share um, this recording. Thank you. So just a few um, opening slides to say that uh, most of you, um, we have trained you because you came in groups. Um, so this uh, promotion where you are allowed to study with your friends and you get nice discounts is still open until the 24th of October. I'm here representing the Aqua Training School. We have a vision for a better society where everyone achieves their full potential. And we do this by providing both accredited and non-accredited programs. These are some of the programs. The key thing is that we used to offer a free e-learning course on the guidelines. Unfortunately, um, it is on hold uh, for now, but we are working with uh, our partners to try and bring back um, this specific course um, to you. But however, these are some of the programs which if you are interested in, you are allowed to contact us. Um, we prefer to communicate via email, um, support at aquatraining.com. Also, if you are already a student with us, always uh, try to engage via this specific um, email, right? So we are going to cover the goals and rules of ART therapy. And then I'll also include, you know, the uh, initiation process. So how do you safely initiate patients on ARVs? Then I will highlight some of the precautions, things that we really need to pay attention to um, um, when you introduce ARVs. So it's very important that when you initiate patients on ARVs, you pay attention to the goals of the program. The first thing is that we want to reduce morbidity and mortality. So you want to give a combination of ARV drugs that are able to help patients, you know, to improve their quality of life and importantly to restore their livelihoods. Um, the other key thing is that we want to restore and preserve the immunologic function. Restoration it's easier because usually here we will be talking about the number of you know um, CD4 cells you know so if someone was initiated at a CD4 count of two and they get to 500 we tend to be happy but preservation in terms of the function and the quality of the immune system is determined by the timing of ART initiation that's why today we talk about universal test and treat our goal is to ensure that every HIV positive person is timely diagnosed and uh, we are able to put our patients on ARVs you know, as soon as possible, preferably when their CD4 counts are above 500 because at that CD4 count, they are likely to improve significantly without experiencing opportunistic infections or even adverse events you know, uh, from the drugs. We also want to give a combination of drugs that's able to achieve maximum durable suppression of the viral load. So this requires us to choose intelligently three ARV drugs, not just any three <laughs> drugs. So there is a way we approach this and we want to achieve maximum. That means we want the viral load to be suppressed and suppression today, we talk about the viral load of less than um, 50 um, 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 copies and durable means for the longest time possible because patients now are living longer. So we want them to remain suppressed you know, for as long as possible. This is one of the reasons why we have sort of shifted from an effavirenz based regimen to a dolutegravir, you know, uh, based regimen, right? Also, as you play with the drugs, you know, stopping one drug and giving the other drug, think about the future of your patient. Every time you make a switch, you are limiting future options because the drug you are removing from the regimen is a very highly likelihood that you won't be able to use it again in the future. So switch with caution, you know, make sure that when you switch, it is really clinically indicated because your patient would need certain drugs in the future. There's also what we call rational um, sequencing. That means if you look at our, our ARV guidelines, you'll see that we traditionally started patients on effavirenz. Those where effavirenz cannot be used to, in today's world, we can still give them dolutegravir. If you fail dolutegravir, you can still use lopinavir, ritonavir, right? Which is a protease inhibitor. But even within the protease inhibitors, sometimes 
we get to it initially, who would give you something like Juranabe, right? It is a protease inhibitor, but we know that if you fail that particular drug, uh, there's a likelihood that Lupinabe won't work, right? So the sequencing of drugs, you say, always start your patients on tenofovir. If you cannot use tenofovir for whatever reason, you want to switch your patient to abacavir. And if you cannot switch your patient to abacavir for whatever reason, and then you want to switch them to zidovudine. We don't want to be starting patients on zidovudine because zidovudine is prioritized as part of our second line standard regimen. So sequencing is very important in terms of preserving uh, future options. And then you want to prescribe such that you maximize um, adherence. You know, in your prescribing habits and how you choose drugs, if you choose drugs that are very toxic, which are going to lead to side effects, your patients are likely to default, right? If your drugs that you have chosen are drugs that are given at the PD or eight hourly, you know, frequency, as an example, adherence is very difficult if you have to take a lifelong drug that has to be taken, you know, um, eight, every eight hours. So we prefer daily doses, right? But also you maximize adherence by giving fixed dose combinations wherever feasible and possible. That is, you want to make sure that your patient is taking the, the minimum number of drugs, you know, and you also reduce the frequency at which those tablets um, are taken. So make sure that as you manage patients, you, are always able to achieve um, these goals in terms of the way you handle ARV drugs, right? Now, monotherapy is not acceptable, you know, in today's world. There are elements where we used to give therapy in uh, monotherapy as a state dose in PMTCT, but if you pay attention, we were not treating HIV. We were probably using monotherapy for prophylaxis to ensure that babies are born without HIV, right? Dual therapy, again, we don't want to give dual therapy because we won't be able to achieve a sustained viral load suppression with, with dual uh, therapy. You'll find that uh, with post-exposure prophylaxis, we used to use zidovudine and amibudine, yes, but we were not treating HIV. So to treat HIV effectively, you need triple therapy, you need always to use three drugs, especially now that I hear that there are drug stock outs, you know, we are struggling to get TLD or there, you know, and so on. That, that is where people who have a good heart start saying, hey, at least my patient, I gave him something. No, in HIV, there's no giving something. You either give three drugs or nothing, right? Because if you give mono or dual therapy, you're going to cause a lot of problems uh, for your patients and they are going to fail treatment. They will need more complicated regimens with more tablets and more side effects. So always treat HIV with a minimum of three drugs, right? Um, that is very, very important. But which three drugs are we talking about? This slide is very important. Um, unfortunately, I didn't include the, the HIV life cycle, which would have showed you that we have drugs that inhibit an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, right? And there's two groups. You've got your nucleoside, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. That's why here we say every regimen must have two nucleosides as a minimum, right? So when I say nucleosides, I mean drugs like tenofovir, um, lamivudine, abacavir, emtricitabine, zidovudine. Right, and, uh, and, and then these two nucleosides, which are the backbone of every regimen, as you can see, then you have to decide whether your patient is able to get an integrase inhibitor, which will be dolutegrave at this point in time, or a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, preferably a favorance, right? And then if you look at our second line regimen, it also has two nucleosides. Right, which is zidovudine and lamivudine, and we combine um, that with a, a, a protease inhibitor, lopinavir, ritonavir. In South Africa, we do not recommend any use of any regimen um, that does not have two nucleosides and a choice between your integrase inhibitor, 
or your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or your PI. If you find yourself prescribing three nucleosides, that regimen is not an ART regimen. It's not going to suppress the viral load you know, for long. Or you find a regimen that has a verapine and a favorance in the same regimen, that means you're prescribing two NNRTIs, right? That's not a very good regimen. Or where you find a favorance plus dolutegrave, and then you have prescribing something else. So. If you look at the standard first line regimen in South Africa, yes, it's three agents, but it's not just any three agents, right? It's two nucleosides plus an integrase inhibitor. That would be tenofovir with lamivudine and dolutegravir. So always all the regimens that are in our current guidelines, they will always meet either of these three structures. If you find yourself prescribing something else, just know that you have violated one of the key principles around HIV uh, management, right? Remember, we are dealing with principles today. Now, the first line therapy in South Africa is a combination of tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. You can see this is two nucleosides, right, plus an integrase inhibitor. So tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. Where dolutegravir cannot be used. For example, patients with uh, C, who are taking other drugs that interact with the Tegra, especially anticonvulsants, um, as an example, patients who might be diabetic, taking high doses of metformin, then you cannot use the Tegra, then you will opt for efavirenz, right? So it will be tenofovir with the lamivudin and tricitabine um, and, and, and um, efavirenz, right? Where a patient has uh, um, issues with TDF, generally it's patients who have a, a renal function that is compromised, right? We prefer that you give an abacave. So you give abacave, lamibudine, and dolutegravir, right? So very important that you need to know your drugs. Obviously today I'm not teaching about the drugs. I think next week I will, I will, we will come back. I will redo the topic on the drugs because the principles you apply them based on your knowledge of the drugs. You need to be able to associate tenofovir with renal toxicity so that you say, fine, here yeah, I need to avoid tenofovir and I'll give abacave. Where both tenofovir and abacave cannot be given, your choice is zidovudin, right? Now here, I'm not teaching you the guidelines, but I just wanted you to appreciate that in the South African guidelines, both the first line and second line ART regimens always follow a regimen that has two nucleosides and a choice between your integrase inhibitor, Dolutegrave, or your non nucleoside, which is a favorance, or a third drug, which is Lopinavir, um, Ritonavir, always. So if you find yourself prescribing something else, you know that you are actually causing harm um, 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 to that uh, particular patient. And then um, um, lamivudine and emtricitabine are drugs that target the same binding site on HIV, and they can be used interchangeably and they represent, you know, the same drug. So that is quite important. I spoke about the importance of improving adherence in terms of our prescribing habits. So you should always you know, try to give your patients a fixed dose combination. What is a fixed dose combination? It is a tablet that has more than one drug um, in it. Therefore, it maximizes adherence by reducing the number of tablets and most of the time, frequency. So in South Africa, we recommend that the 99.9% .9 of our patients should take a combination of 10 of four there with lamivudin and also um, dolutegrave. This is uh, very important, right? Um, that we, we, we do that. So that is our recommended standard first line regimen. It's one tablet that has three drugs and you take it once uh, per day. Where there's contraindications to dolutegrave, you can then give your patients an efavirenz-based regimen. And even that, it is a single tab once at night. Right, with tenofovir, emtricitabine, and efavirenz. And we call it a TEE -E regimen, right? But we also have a TLD regimen, which is our recommended one. If I take you back to this slide, which has zidovudine, lamivudine, let's say a patient is taking second line, right? 
Zidobudin, Lamipudin, and DTG. There is no single tablet that has these three drugs together. But we do have a tablet that has Zidobudin and Lamipudin, right? So you, you can prescribe these two drugs as a fixed dose combination, right? Then prescribe to Lutegravir. So your patient will probably take two tablets, right? Even here, we do have a combination of Abakave and Lamipudin, but the, the combination does not have to detect rapid. That means now you also need to know the other fixed dose combinations, Zidovudin and Lamivudin. You can see the strengths there, 300 over Lamivudin 150. So this is a BD tablet, right? Plus whatever third drug you are giving, whether Lopinavir, Ritonavir, or to detect rapid. If you prescribe someone where Tenofovir is contraindicated, and you prescribe Abakave, Lamivudin, with Dolutegrave, you can give Abakave and Lamivudin as a fixed dose um, combination because you're minimizing number of tablets with DTG. The patient will take two tablets daily and you, you would have really improved, you know, adherence and made uh, things very easy and simple uh, for your patient, which is what I'm trying to, to, to emphasize. Just remember that before you start patients on ARBs, don't forget the psychosocial aspect. Sometimes we are ready as clinicians to give ARPs, but patients are not ready. So we have to assess their readiness. Are you ready? Are you willing to start ARPs? But also psychosocially, is there support, you know, disclosure, you know, and, and hunger? But there's many issues that patients suffer from which can hamper adherence to ARP drugs. We always recommend that opportunistic infections must be treated before ARPs. Um, I started because if you start ARVs before treating certain opportunistic infections, you can actually cause more harm because these infections become more exaggerated, right? TB screening every visit, and if you diagnose TB, you want to start TB treatment first. Always do your baseline um, CD4 count and staging, and don't forget to always assess patients who might be eligible for this life-saving prophylaxis therapies. We've got cotrimoxazole prophylaxis therapy, which prevents pneumonia and, and, and diarrhea, specifically uh, uh, PJP, PCP pneumonia. We've got isoniazid prophylaxis therapy, which is meant to prevent TB in people living with HIV and AIDS. We've got fluconazole prophylaxis therapy, which is given to patients with CD4 count less than 100 who have a positive um, CREC antigen, right? Once you have assessed your patient and you believe that the patient is someone that can be initiated, you then prepare your patient, you choose the regimen, then you initiate your patient. So initiation is just not just about giving the drugs. You have to do your pre-ART you know, workup. Yes, it's same day, but you have to screen patients for TB and ensure that they don't have before you cause more problems for your patient. So these are the important steps in initiating um, ARPs for patients. You have to take history. I tell you what, if you don't take proper history from patients, you're going to mismanage them. You'll give wrong drugs to the wrong patient, the right patient, something like that, you know, because the regimen really, uh, for you to choose the drugs for a patient, you need to know your patient, you need to do some basic tests, even if it's a urine deep sticks, for example, if it's got protein, you, 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 there's drugs you must avoid. If she's uh, pregnant, so that's why you must do a pregnancy test, you know, if she's pregnant, there's things you have to consider as you initiate your patient. And then we must educate our patients before we give, you know, medicines. And these are the steps, very important uh, in initiation. Initiation is not just prescribing. You have first to determine whether this patient in front of you, is it someone you can initiate ARV same day, or you need to wait for a week or two or even six weeks, depending on certain findings from your history and um, examination, you know? If it's a patient that you can initiate today, has your patient been exposed to ARVs before? So, before, you know, because if they have failed ARVs before, you can't start them on the standard first line regimen. They will probably need second line. If it's a patient who is stable, who has never been on ARVs before, therefore they are for a regimen one, which regimen one drugs are safe? Right. Yes, I said 99.9%. We want to give tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. But there are patients where, uh, even if it's first line, 
they are likely to give them a first line without tenor for me. Like if on your test there, your protein was two plus, or it's a known diabetic, also hypertensive, who was admitted for kidney problems, and the patient is even over 50 years, like a 70 year old, you know that tenor for me is going to push them into acute renal failure. Right, a pregnant lady who's two days pregnant or five days pregnant, basically early in the first trimester, you want to reconsider the use of the retagrame. So here you decide whether this is a patient for regimen one or two. Once you say regimen one, which drugs are safe? If you have chosen the drugs, which are the blood tests that need to be done as part of your monitoring of this particular patient? So this is very, very, very important. Um, as you initiate so that you don't make mistakes. So in terms of step one and the timing, so stable HIV positive patients and pregnant women, we fast track them for same day initiation, right? So when you say stable, we mean a patient who's willing to start and they are also clinically stable. But in pregnancy, we do not have a lot of choices because time is against us. We need to ensure that pregnant women are suppressed as soon as possible, especially before delivery time comes, right? If a patient has a TB or even a stage four condition, you might want to treat TB first, you know, for at least two weeks, then start ARBs, you know, uh, because you don't want them to complicate and get exaggerated inflammatory responses from these severe opportunistic infections. If your patient has TB meningitis or cryptococcal meningitis, here we do not want to rush and start ARBs. ARBs are a lifesaver but these patients are likely to get an exaggerated inflammatory response if we start them ARVs earlier, right? So we treat crypto for at least a month, you know, and then when the patient is stable, we then start them on ARV. So that is the first step on timing, right? I see your comments uh, towards the end. Uh, I will make time to go through um, your comments. So remember step two was saying, choose whether regimen one or two. And the biggest question here is whether your patient is a patient who has been on ARVs before or not. So if it's Dr. Mawela, who is clinically stable, right, who falls here, so it's for same day initiation, there's no problem, he's willing, he's got support, let's suppose. Have you been on ARVs, Dr. And I say no, then I'm for regimen one. But if I say yes, you want to take proper assessment. Why? Which drugs were you taking? Why did you stop? Did you experience side effects? How was your viral load? Was it high? Because if the viral load was high, probably the patient needs second line, right? But Dr. Mawela is clinically stable and has never been on ARVs before. Therefore, he's a regimen one um, a patient. Now, step three, which, which, um, which uh, drugs, you know? So how do you choose a regimen? You first want to give Dr. Mawela the, the standard first line regimen for adults, which is tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir, right? That is what you want to give him. It's the preferred regimen. But the question is, Dr. Mawela, if he's a 70-year-old, will he be able to cope with tenofovir? If not, then you need to look for an alternate, right? If he's got two pluses of protein, what if Dr. Mawela is a female who's two days pregnant? You should probably avoid dolutegravir, right? Or he's diabetic, he's taking metformin 858 hours. You know, dolutegravir and diabetic, especially metformin, you, 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 you are not supposed to exceed 500 milligrams per day. But if I'm already controlled, you would rather avoid DTG than to change my anti-diabetic um, you know, uh, medications. So most patients must receive this regimen. It is an advantage because there's a one tap daily, which has the three drugs, right? And then, but you need to determine if there's any contraindications to turn off of there or to detect of there. Lamivudine is generally well tolerated without any significant problems. Where tenofovir cannot be used, then you would use abacave, right? With lamivudine and dolutegrave. You'll give the fixed dose combination of abacave and lamivudine, then add dolutegrave as a second um, tablet, right? Where you cannot use dolutegrave usually is because of women who are very early in their pregnancy, especially the first eight weeks. Right. I know in the guidelines, they don't mention the eight, they just say the first trimester. But we generally know that the neural tube gets formed in the first eight, I mean, six to eight weeks. So by eight, by eight weeks, uh, it's already formed. You could still give DTG safely to women. 
But uh, the key message here is that where you cannot use dolutegra for whatever reason, whether uh, it's a pregnancy related or drug drug interactions, efavirenz then becomes your drug of choice. But remember, uh, active psychosis, so someone who's delusional or hallucinating, that's an absolute contraindication to the use of efavirenz, right? Alternately, you would give them lopina veritonavir. So in other words, where you cannot use dolutegravir, you need to choose between efavirenz and lopina veritonavir. If your patient is neuropsychiatrically stable, then efavirenz uh, is a drug uh, that you can do. So again, where you cannot use dolutegravir, you'll give tenofovir, lamivudine, and a choice between efavirenz and um, lopina veritonavir. Pay attention every time you want to give the integravir to drug drug interactions, especially known epileptics, you know, who are controlled on uh, phenytoin and those kind of drugs. You cannot give the integravir with those kind of drugs. You need to be very careful. Uh, tegretol and so on, right? Now, in summarizing, just remember this slide. This is from the guidelines. I, I didn't do it myself. I always say, if you want to determine a, the best regimen for your patient, always check their age, check their age and their, their weight, right? So you'll see that children after being born, uh, for the first four weeks, we recommend Zidovudin, Lamivudin, and Neverapine. This is because you cannot use Abacabe in this unit. We don't know the dose. And Lopina Veritonavir makes these kids a bit sick, right? As soon as the child's age crosses at three kgs and the child is more than four weeks of age, you can then give them the standard first line regimen for children, which is Abacabe, Lamivudin, and Lopina Veritonavir. Now you'll see that as soon as the age crosses 20 kgs, you now have uh, an additional drug that you can use, which is dolutegravir, right? And then once children cross 35 kgs and they are more than 10 years old, they now qualify for the adult regimen. So this is the adult regimen. So this regimen is for any adult who's got a weight above 35 and their age is more than 10 years. So that is very um, important. Just note that for this uh, age group here, um, efavirenz can still be used, but the, the child must be more than three years um, of age and the, the weight being more than 10 kg. So efavirenz is still an option for this uh, group here. And most children will probably get um, this regimen here. So this is what we call the standard first line regimen for pediatrics, right? Um, so this is a repeat, though not uh, <laughs> in, a, in a nice diagram, just to say that remember tenofovir for adults, the dose is 300 milligrams per oz daily. But remember tenofovir should only be given to patients with a weight of more than 35 kgs and the age of more than 10 years. So if you've got someone with a weight less than 35 or they're like nine years, you should avoid tenofovir, lamivudine, no comments. Dolutegravir only if the weight is more than 20 kg. So you can give it to children, but once their weight is more than 20 kg, that is fine. If I reference the full adult regimen, I mean dose of 600 milligrams, only if the weight is above 40 kg. If the weight is below 40 kg, um, you should use a favorence 400 milligrams per hour. Um, no, 10. Just remember the 400 milligrams is the pediatric capsules, the 200 milligrams capsule, we give two of those. In children, a fibrance can be given if the weight is more than 10 kgs and their age is more than three years. Um, forget uh, this red thing, but just to say that uh, children's uh, dosages should always be prescribed based on their weight all the time, not sometime, right? So this is an important slide. You can take a picture with your phone, but uh, I will share the video and stuff. And just remember um, um, these uh, age bands, you know, when you can start to give um, which drug safely um, to patients, right? Once you have chosen your drugs, if one of your drugs you have chosen is tenofovir, you would then do a creatinine if they are pregnant. For non-pregnant adults, we do a creatinine clearance. And if it is less than... 50, this would be regarded as abnormal. You should avoid the use of tenofovir. Um, for zidovudine, um, we monitor.
tied with an HB. If the HB is less than seven, you should avoid the drug. We rarely use nevirapine nowadays, but we monitor it with an ALT, which is part of our liver function test. And if it is more than 100, you want to avoid the drug. If you have prescribed lopinavir, ritonavir, you will do your cholesterol or your lipid profile um, when the patient has taken lopinavir, ritonavir for three months. So you don't do it at baseline, you do it when the patient has taken um, that drug for three months. As for Abacave, Lamivudin, and Entrocetabine, and Efavirenz also, there are no blood tests that we, we need to do, right? These are some of the assessments that need to be done. You know, teaching patients about side effects, TB screening every visit, adherence every visit, education about safe sex, pregnancy status every visit uh, for women who are of childbearing age want to do a pregnancy test. Uh, weight and BMIs, WHO staging every visit, assess your patients for IPT. Hepatitis B is now regarded as a baseline assessment and you do it again anytime you want to stop the first line that has 10 of obey, you must check the hepatitis B status of your patient. You want to do a pap smear, CD4 count at baseline and then at 12 months, not annually. So that needs to change. Your first viral load, so there's no baseline viral load. The first viral load is done when the patient has been on ARPs for at least um, um, six months, right? So that's very important. And then if, and then these three drugs, you don't, I mean, these three tests, you don't do them all the time. They're determined by the regimen. So if your patient, you have prescribed Zidovudin, you might want to do um, an HB. If you have prescribed Tenofovir, you might want to do a creatine clearance at baseline three months, six months, and one year. If you have prescribed Nevirapine, ALT, and if you prescribe lopinavir, ritonavir, once your patient has taken ARVs for three months, right, you do a fasting cholesterol and triglycerides. If this test comes back normal, you don't need to repeat it um, at all. Right. So those are the four steps. Determine if this patient can be initiated same day. If yes, uh, has the patient been on ARVs before? If no, which three drugs from the first line can you give? Based on their history and stuff, you determine the safe three drugs and then you do your baseline test for your patient. Then you prescribe for your patient. So, you know, um, that is key. Pay attention. Remember, we are dealing with principles. So pay attention to TB and uh, ARV drugs. So your NRTIs, this is tenofovir, lamivudin, uh, zidovudin, abacave. They are metabolized through the renal system. So when a patient is started on a rifampicin-based TB regimen, we don't need to make any um, adjustments. If the patient is taking dolutegravir 50 milligrams daily, when they are on rifampicin, you need to increase um, the dose to 50 milligrams twice a day. Efavirenz is actually the preferred third drug to be taken in patients who have TB who are taking TB because we don't need to do any dose adjustments and it is safe with TB um, um, treatment, right? However, sometimes patients have other issues where we cannot use efavirenz. Nevirapine is a no-go area. We never give nevirapine with TB treatment because of the shared liver toxicity. Uh, but also rifampicin um, reduces the blood levels very significantly. And um, yeah, and then lopinavir, ritonavir, you've got two options, which is either to double the dose. Remember the standard dose is 400 milligrams over 100, which is uh, two tablets BD. So here you'll give uh, four tablets uh, BD. Your adherence will be an issue with the exaggerated side effects. Then you have, uh, uh, oh, so you either double the dose or you super boost. Super boost means you prescribe the standard dose, the two tablets BD, you then prescribe additional um, retonavir, S300 milligrams per os BD. And this is important because rifampicin increases the metabolism of uh, certain ARB drugs, specifically nevirapine, Dolutegravir, efavirenz, and uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, but efavirenz is safe to give, right? And if these drug levels are reduced, then your patient um, is likely to, to then fail treatment if you don't pay um, attention to this. Another key thing, um, which is uh, probably one of the few last slides, is to note that when you look at the standard first line regimen, 
it has tenofovir, amivudin, and dolutegravir, right? These two drugs, tenofovir, lamivudin, or uh, empricitabine, are also active against hepatitis B. So it's very important that any time where you are considering to switch a patient from first line to second line or to stop tenofovir, that you must check the patient's hepatitis B status, right? For example, you know that if a patient is taking first line ART regimen, tenofovir, lamivudin, and let's say, for argument's sake, um, dolutegravir, right? And they develop two viral loads, and we think we think the patient is failing um, treatment. We would then switch um, this patient to to second line um, treatment: um, zidovudin, lamivudin, and lopinavir, um, ritonavir. Right now, what you see is that tenofovir has been stopped. Now we are not allowed to stop tenofovir if the patient has hepatitis B. Right. So where a patient needs standard second line regimen, zidovudin, lamivudin, and lopinavir, tonavir, but the patient also has hepatitis B, we should never stop TDF. So these patients will get one, two, three, four drugs, zidovudin, tenofovir, lamivudin, and lopinavir, tonavir, um, where zidovudin, lamivudin, and either of these two drugs would be treatment, for, for HIV, tenofovir and lamivudin are kept in the regimen to manage hepatitis B. This is very important. Otherwise, your patient comes back with a, a acute hepatitis, which sometimes is difficult um, to manage, right? So in summarizing some of the um, key issues uh, which we discussed today, always treat patients uh, as if they are going to default. If you take a position that says patients are going to adhere, you are going to, to, to miss a lot of patients and you are not going to be able to support them. So always, when you start patients, make sure that you educate them, you know, assess the social setup, bring another, you know, a person, friend, uh, partner who will support the patient at home, encourage disclosure, and then monitor your patients every visit whether they are taking their treatment correctly. So it's very important. Um, there are drugs that don't, that don't do well when the viral load is very high, like Abacabe, but uh, we use it anyway. And we know that some patients might suppress later rather than earlier. But today's uh, regimen, which has uh, Dolutegrave, it's quite potent. And most patients should be suppressed after taking ARVs for three months, right? I've just discussed with you um, hepatitis B co-infection to say always before you stop tenofovir, check the status for hepatitis B. If hepatitis uh, B is positive, you should keep tenofovir and lamivudin um, in that regimen. If you have sexually active women of childbearing age, you need to encourage um, uh, family planning as much as possible. Um, you might want to discuss risks associated with taking dolutegravir versus nevirapine. But at the end of the day, the decision is the woman's uh, decision to make. So we do allow women who are not on reliable contraceptives to take dolutegravir, but it must be an informed decision, right? And she must know the risks involved. We know the risk is very little, but uh, at this point in time, that's what we have to do, right? Uh, pregnancy, again, um, 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 two things about pregnancy. One is that we want to fast track initiation as much as possible because there's a, a third party there, you know, the baby whom we want the baby to be born negative and the mother must be healthy. But the dolutegravel and first trimester issues um, are, are current issues, and, uh, especially the first six to eight weeks. That's where you might want to avoid um, dolutegravel. Pre-existing renal disease, very important. Uh, the drug to avoid there is tenofovir. Um, so you want to ensure that you screen patients, as, uh, especially with a, ur a basic urine dipstick. It's quite helpful. Then you do your creatinine. Now, um, a drug like elopinavir increases blood levels of your cholesterol. Patients have central obesity. Some patients become diabetic and hypertensive. So that increases the risk for, for, for cardiac, you know, or cardiovascular incidences. 
So you to monitor patients uh, very carefully. And uh, Abacave also has been associated with myocardial infections. So if a patient is a no myocardial infection, maybe you might want to avoid the use of Abacave. Acute uh, psychiatric disease, <clears throat> specifically psychosis, you want to avoid efferents um, um, in that instance. With TB treatment, I've already summarized it for you to say your NRT is tenopovase, you don't need to do any adjustments. Efavirenz is the safest to give with TB treatment. If your patient is already on dolutegravir, 50 milligrams daily, you want to increase it to 50 milligrams PD. Um, Nevirapine, you should avoid fully. Lopinavir, retonavir, you either double the dose or you prescribe additional um, return away, which is what we call super boosting. Just note that we have uh, some level of transmitted resistance where someone who has never been on ARVs before, we give them ARVs and ARVs, they are failing to suppress because the partner or the sexual partner is someone who's on ARVs or really taking second line or third line, you know, with a very bad bug. So some patients get a very bad bug uh, from the start, which is very unfortunate. Yeah? And then uh, tenofovir can cause low bone mineral density. That's why we don't give it to children who are growing, uh, especially those less than 10 years. So whenever you have a patient, even if it's an adult who complains of body pains and weakness on tenofovir, you might want um, to assess, um, 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 send them for a bone scan and you see what's going on. So, I think, um, let me see, yeah, so a very important uh, bullet, this one, right? Remember, you're allowed to stop, let's say a patient has kidney problems, you're allowed to stop tenofovir and give up a cover, but single drug substitutions are allowed if the viral load is suppressed, right? When a patient has a high viral load, you should investigate and confirm if they're failing treatment. If they're failing, they need a new regimen, so you must always, uh, separate a, the need for a regimen and from a need for a single drug substitution. Because if someone who's got a high viral load, you stop one drug and give another drug, you are now limiting future options. You're causing all the drugs to fail. So that is very important. And then the other thing is that if uh, one drug must be stopped in, in terms of ARVs. You stop the whole regimen, right? Go in, in ARVs, there's no, we are starting these drugs, you know, one by one and testing them like we would do in the TB world, right? In HIV, you either give three drugs or you give nothing. So if you have to stop one drug, you stop the whole regimen, right? Or you give an alternate better regimen, but it should always be three drugs. Um, um, that is um, the rule, right? So, yeah, I've been talking alone <laughs> for a while. So I'm hoping, you know, uh, you were able to, those who did NIMART, I hope this was a good revision uh, for you. But uh, I want you to, um, to do this case for me. Um, we can do it together, but uh, you may type in, uh, let me see. Yes, it's a very simple case, Kim Mildred, isn't it? Those who know my cases, they always have names. Uh, today is not Sarah. I know some of you know Sarah. Sarah is a problematic case, uh, but it's Mildred. So let's discuss Mildred just for a, a few moments. A uh, few seconds, I want to change my, uh, how do I see the arrow? Yes, okay, cool. All right, so let's do the case together. So Mildred is a 26 year old um, HIV positive female. She is uh, six weeks pregnant and weighs 33 kgs uh, with a CD4 count of 56. She has a history of being psychotic and she's on TB treatment for five days and she presents to you, right? So just think about the case before you start typing. <laughs> but if you get a chance to type in Let's start with the first question there. Is uh, Mildred, does she qualify for ARVs? Um, that is a, a question that requires uh, all of us to participate. Just say yes or no in the chat box. I'll come back to your, to your questions. Type, 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 yes, 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 don't, yes. I see, I see, I see. You're saying yes, 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 yes. And I tell you what, 
as you think about it, as you are about to, to type, yes, she qualifies and I see her not yet. I know why, because eligibility, you know, definitions is a question of whether does she qualify or not, or I'm talking about whether she will start ARVs today or not. So in terms of whether she qualifies for, for, for ARVs or not, the answer is yes, because of she is HIV positive. So in South Africa, we use what we call universal test and treat, right? However, is she a patient that you want to start today? Probably not, because uh, there's a number of problems uh, with Bentred. I think the first thing is that she's got a very low CD4 count. She needs ARVs, she's psychotic. We are not sure whether this psychosis uh, is due to HIV infecting the brain, like, uh, you know, or it's another issue. And then she's got TB. We don't know whether this TB is uh, uh, also in the brain, which would make it a meningitis. But let's presume for now it's pulmonary TB and she's taking treatment for five days. So if you look at the PMCCT guidelines, so in non-pregnant people, we want to delay ARVs like for another, you know, nine days. Um, also, so that when she's two weeks, we want to start. But if you go to the PMTCT guidelines, the current recommendation is that if Mildred does not have danger signs, so she's not the uh, hypotensive, her BP, you know, is okay. Yes, her pulse might be slightly up, but it's not like more than 120. And then she's not wheezing, she's breathing, you know, even if it might be a little bit fast, but it's not like tachypnea where she's struggling for her breath you would probably still start both the TB treatment and the ARVs on the same thing, right? So, so differentiate pregnant versus non-pregnant uh, people. In non-pregnancy, we, we, uh, you know, we are not too urgent about starting ARVs. In pregnancy, we are urgent, and you would educate here about the risks that if I'm going to start your ARVs today, it means that you, know, you might come back feeling a bit worse in the next few days. If it does happen, come to me, come and see me, right? Um, and, and that is what is in the PMTCT guidelines. Remember now, the, the, the case says she's six weeks pregnant. So she's a PMTCT case. Now PMTCT uh, or HIV in pregnancy, we've got now unique guidelines um, that deal um, with these women, right? So what is her WHO stage? May you type there in the chat box, like WhatsApp. I'm sure all of us, we can type. What do you think is her WHO stage? Nontoweko, you say three, do you all agree? She's three, come on, come on, come on. Penelope, you think she's four? I wish I could ask all of you why. Some are saying two, three, four, two. All right, it's fine. So let's look at the case. So in terms of... Uh, uh, the obvious thing she has is pulmonary TB, which is a stage three condition, right? If it's a TB meningitis, extra pulmonary TB, she would be stage four. So the obvious thing from this three sentences we have is that she's a stage three case. However, I don't know if we take a 26 year old and we plot her on a graph, we do the BMIs and stuff. It's a very highly low likelihood that she's underweight or uh, uh, what, especially for a pregnant lady, she's probably underweight or even wasted. We don't see her, but if she is, she'll be a stage four patient. If this psychosis is caused by a medical condition, let's say toxoplasmosis, TB in the brain, cryptococcus in the brain, or HIV encephalopathy, those are stage four conditions, right? So based on the three lines, she's stage three, but there's a high probability that she's a stage four patient. Remember, we stage patients based on a clinical condition that they have. You must have reason uh, for your staging um, that you are choosing, right? So does she qualify for ARVs? Uh, who wants to propose a regimen? Which three drugs will you choose for this uh, patient? Can you try and type if possible? TEE, tenofovir, uh, emtricitabine, efavirenz. Any of us come guys? Type in TLD, okay. I don't want to give you hints. <laughs> so I'm hoping you'll be confident. I see, you see with the first question, the yeses were too many. With the regiments, I only have four people. Come on, TEE, DTG, um, Masinga, 
Abakaves, Zido, Udin. You are giving three, N three NRTIs, my pizza. You should always have two NRTIs and you choose between um, the Lutegra V, Favorant, and uh, uh, Lopina V, Ritona V. Abaka V, all right. Yeah, it's not an easy one, because eh? I see you are really agreeing. And in fact, you should not say DTG 100. We would rather say DTG 50 milligrams BD because you're not supposed to give it as 100 daily. You should make it twice daily with TG treatment. All right, let's discuss it to, to, uh, uh, together. Let's discuss it together. I can see that, hey, this regiments. Laura, hey, song is, let's see. Very close, very close. Yeah, all right. All right. Uh, Zanele, all right. Yeah. So let me tell you what the concerns are. So the first concern is that uh, which you need to, if now if you read the case history, uh, after Mildred, there, they say she's six weeks pregnant. So she's in the first trimester and it's early in the first trimester, right? You know, six weeks, uh, if you are sure of the dates, you might give DTG, but I would probably avoid DTG. Uh, 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 it's too early, you know, and most women are not even sure of their weeks. So they tell you six can be four weeks and all those things. So, but if you have a sauna and you are sure, you might consider it. But generally, if we follow the guidelines as written, we would avoid DTG. So DTG is out for this patient, right? If we just agree on that, just because of she's too early. In in the in the in the in the pregnancy then it says she weighs 33 kgs 33 kgs remember that 33 kgs 10 off of a 10 off of a you can only give it when the patient's weight is above 35 kgs right so 10 off of a is out so i'm, I'm reading things that are on the case and i'm interpreting them for you 10 off of a is out right then uh, the CD4 count is fine. We'll deal with it later. Then she has a history of, shows the, the, the history from history, she's psychotic. So if she's psychotic, you are not going to give a favorance to this patient. So in summary, six weeks pregnant, DTG is out. The weight is 33 kgs, tenopovay is out because we give tenopovay when the weight is above 35, right? Psychosis, active psychosis, absolute contraindication to um, a favorite, right? Now, TB treatment does not affect your NRTI. So if you wanted to give, so now let's go back, right? If I want to make it easy for you. Few seconds, I know we are, our time is up, right? Remember I said to you, this is the regimen you want to give to most of your patients, like even Mildred. We want to give Mildred 10 of the Lamivudin to Lutegrave. But the last bullet there says you must always determine if there are any contraindications to 10 of the or the Lutegrave. We know that we can't give 10 of the to Mildred because a weight is below 35 kg. So that's what we know. So therefore, we give a back away. So we agree on Abakave. Lamivudin stays in the regimen. Now we need to assess if the Lutegrave is safe for this patient. Well, she's in the first six weeks of her pregnancy, right? So we want to avoid um, the Lutegrave. And if you look at the options we have, if you cannot give the Lutegrave, you want to give Efavirenz or Lopinave, Ritonave, right? Efavirenz is out. Why? She's got active psychosis. Right, then we are left with Lopina V, Ritona V. So her regimen would be Abaka V, Lamivudin, and Lopina V, Ritona V. I saw some of you, including Songis, I think you chose this regimen. Ne? Abaka V, Lamivudin, with Lopina V, Ritona V. But then I showed you this slide here, right? That's how you put it all together. I said, when you give lopina veritona ve in a patient who's taking TB treatment, you cannot, you must say, I will give a tenofo ve, I will give lamivudin, I mean, sorry, abaka ve with lamivudin, but when you get to lopina veritona ve, you either need to double the dose, then Mildred is an adult, she's able to take tablets, so you can just double the tablets 
from two tablets BD to four tablets BD, which would be 400 over 200, or you prescribe the standard dose, which is uh, 400 over 100 plus retonavir, retonavir, right? So in summary, if you look at the, the, the regimen for Mildred, it will be Abacave 300 milligrams per oz, I mean 600 milligrams per oz daily plus Lamivudin 300 milligrams per oz daily as a fixed dose combination. Then you give Lopina Veritonavir. If you opt to double the dose, it will be 800 over 200 milligrams per oz PD. If you opt to prescribe additional Ritonavir, it will be Lopina Veritonavir 400 over 100 milligrams per oz PD plus Ritonavir 300 milligrams per oz PD. I hope you are with me. I hope so, right? And then uh, what is the appropriate monitoring of the regimen? Our regimen is um, 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 abacave. You don't need to do any blood test. Lamivudin, no blood test. Lopina veritonave, yes, you want to monitor diarrhea. You want to do your lipid profile when the patient has taken Lopina veritonave for three months, right? That's what you want to do. Then you might do other things. Your baseline test is pregnant. You want to do your basic antenatal care services and package. You want to ensure that the, uh, the viral load is not going to be done in six months time. It's going to be done in three months time because in pregnancy, we don't wait for six months. We do it at three months from the time ARVs are started. You know, you do your creatinine levels, not creatinine clearance. You do your urine deep stick, you screen her. Okay, she's got TB, make sure that she's adherent, you know. And then they say, what other treatments would you consider for this patient? Who wants to add? What other treatments do you want to consider? We are done. Which prophylaxis therapies does she qualify for? And you must refer her. Psychosis in pregnancy, she must be referred. Don't forget that, ne? because we need to ensure that she doesn't cause harm to herself. Hey, you have run out of stock, oh, sister. Cotrimoxazole, eh? not Cotrimazole. Okay, it's the same. Yeah, 960 milligrams. Perfect, perfect. I'm happy to see that. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So you'll give the patient Cotrimoxazole, 960 milligrams per hour daily. She might qualify for fluconazole prophylaxis, but we don't know. So you'd have to do a baseline crack antigen because a CD4 count is less than 100. If that crack antigen test, cryptococcus uh, uh, test from the blood comes back positive, then she might qualify for fluconazole prophylaxis therapy, which would be fluconazole to, I mean, 800 milligrams for two weeks, then 400 milligrams for two months, then 200 milligrams for up to a year, right? Ah, that was my story. I hope uh, you have um, 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 enjoyed uh, this session. I'm going to stop the recording.